Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, not related to Rise Bar, but Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out rise25.com. It's run by myself and John Corcoran. It's application only. Today, we have Pete Spinoza, founder of Rise Bar. Now, after acquiring a small operation in San Diego, Pete turned around the health snack company. Rise Bar can be found in select Whole Foods, Sprouts Farmers Market, Vitamin Shop, and many more online and offline channels. Their facility is entirely free of wheat, cane sugar, GMOs, meat, eggs, and peanuts, ensuring the products are gluten-free and soy-free. Pete, thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Jeremy. Great to be here. You know, what's interesting, so I have so many questions here in a short amount of time. We're going to try and jam everything in, but um, you fun fact about you. Um, you ran with the Bulls and you're skydive certified. Does <laughs> yeah, this um, relate to business? What do you get out of these death-defying or thrill-seeking um, activities <laughs> from entrepreneurship? I, I think, um, well, when I was younger, I was a little bit of a wild kid, um, just as, as a little kid, always running around. But I noticed as I became an adult, I, I became a lot more risk-averse. And so for me, over the past mm. couple of years, it's as it relates to entrepreneurship, it's being able to kind of push myself past the comfort zone. Yeah. And I notice oftentimes when I get a little bit too comfortable in life, it, it, rela- it relates to the business. And anytime I kind of push the boundary a little bit, I, I notice that my team responds accordingly. So hmm. definitely a, a correlation there. What, do you, what did you want to be when you grew up, when you were younger? <laughs> when, I was, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a, a firefighter. You did. But as I became a, a teenager, I, I really wanted to be a doctor. And that transition into a lifestyle actually more towards health and fitness. And I've been what kind of do- doctor? Um, wanted to be a, typically a surgeon, um, really? specialist or surgeon. You know what's interesting about your background, which was out of place for me, was your anthropology major in, at Harvard. <laughs> that didn't make <laughs> I, any I, sense to me. I, I'm I'm obsessed with the study of people, kind of what makes them tick, and then yeah. it kind of helped. Uh, I was more biological anthropology as well, which is study of bones and in archaeology. So. Mm. And I I think I read or listened online that your dad has been a big influence, big mentor to you. He's been huge. Yeah. He's uh, both he and my, my grandfather, great grandfather, they were all kind of entrepreneurs in their own right, small businesses here and there. So it's kind of uh, ingrained in my DNA. So what I want to hear, what did you see from your dad growing up? What was he? What uh, ventures was he doing? Uh, well, my dad is—he's very old school. He's had the same business for the last thirty-five years, um, but seeing how incredibly resilient he's been, and, and more important, how he's—he's he's been able to just manage a lot of balance in his life. Um, I didn't really—he had me when he was a little bit later in life, around thirty-five. So I didn't really see the first ten years of, of him running his business mm-hmm. and how much of a grind it was. Yeah. A lot, a lot of anxiety and stress. Um, so I, I saw the good side where he found more balance and spent so much time like rarely did he miss like a basketball game. And we, we made sure we always went on a couple of vacations. So that's that's kind of where I am now as a 34 year old single male trying to build my business and right. grind my butt away so that I can have more balance uh, in the next few years. What's the biggest lesson that he's taught you or that he instills on you? Uh, w- without a doubt, just just seeing how um, how resilient he's been. Um, I think he also is, he's found a way to find um, what what he loves, what he does. He really enjoys um, being able to create a business, having an impact in the restaurant industry. And he, if he really despised his job or disliked it, he wouldn't have been able to go for 35 years. So just m- making sure that I found a, a hobby and vocation that I was truly passionate about. Yeah. And so early on, you were doing medical equipment sales, right? 
I was, yeah. I was involved in medical devices, sales, and marketing. And so then you wanted to do your own thing. So what were the other things on the table besides this this company? Um, so I, after reading the, the four hour work week, which I know everyone's very familiar with, it kind of inspired me to find, uh, my own type of business, um, some kind of an entrepreneurial venture. So I took a year to kind of travel. I, I went all over the world, visited friends around the country and came across probably a cl- over a hundred different, um, business opportunities, whether they were d- ideas of my own or other young entrepreneurs who needed some kind of startup capital, which I had accumulated just from, uh, for medical devices. Yeah. Um, and I found myself really inching. To, I've always been passionate in health and fitness, and I found myself studying the natural foods industry, and saw that even throughout the the whole economic crash, it was one of the only industries that grew at you know double digit compound annual growth. So mm-hmm. I started to say, you know what? I'm passionate about health and f- fitness. I love food. I, on my own journey, I found that I was gluten intolerant. So I started to study kind of the gluten free and paleo niche, mm-hmm. and found kind of a, a match made in heaven eventually. So when you found that, what other type of businesses did you look at that maybe were second and third? Um, I definitely looked at, at the time. This is where um, apps were just kind of starting to, to become um, made on, on iPhone and Apple. Um, so there were a lot of young entrepreneurs who tried to start these different fitness apps here and there. Um, there were some very small startup kind of um, vitamin and supplement manufacturers and then just some very basic granola companies. Um, but I... I I wasn't as passionate as I was about finding something in kind of the, the nutrition bar category, which I felt I could get my arms around. So I came across a lot of really cool businesses, yeah. um, but for one reason or another, they just weren't the right fit. So Pete, how did you find this small operation in San Diego? Uh, a really good buddy of mine um, I, I went to grad school with, he was um, kind of a, a broker and investment banker in health and wellness. Been doing it for a couple years prior. Yeah. And so he came across a really cool little company based out of San Diego, but they were incredibly like strapped, um, de- hemorrhaging cash, um, you know, th- still like a, at a very small scale, but I saw that they had such really whole and healthy ingredients. Yeah. And after tasting, that's where I kind of fell in love. Tried about thirty other different bars. I've always been a huge bar aficionado, yeah. and thought that because of like the wholesome ingredients, the really simplicity of what they were about, I thought could, if we could translate this into like a protein bar, you know, a high protein bar, there was nothing else that even remotely close to that that existed in kind of the simplicity in a high protein format. So, be, talk about the first time you walked into this prospective business because I know there were some concern. I mean, there were some issues with their operation. Before you got there, I mean. So there, what, what, just paint the picture when walking through the facility. Uh, there, there's, there's a, what, as I've found kind of just in general, there, there's always hair on every single deal. And what I saw was I love that they made their own bars, which is great. Um, I, I love just the manufacturing. Um, but I saw that there were I, – I feel like there were a lot of corners that were being cut. And just for any listeners, viewers that are watching um, – Kind of so, and what I found in CPG just throughout um, kind of that one year trial, what I found over the past five years is still it's a little scary what can go on behind packaged food. Right. So, just because something appears to be yeah. good does not, you, you have no clue how that stuff is like made. what? Like, give me an example, yeah. Um, just touring other facilities, I mean, right. you would see quite frankly, uh, like cockroaches in the facility, a lot of cobwebs, just it's not very sanitary. Some like the 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 that FD, is scary. Like, the FDA doesn't do a great job necessarily regulating. We, we, they drop in every single uh, year. We've done a great job in our new facility in Irvine, 15,000 square feet, gorgeous facility. Um, but what, what, I've, what I saw in so many other facilities is just very kind of dog-eared, kind of like, a, like that kind of that local restaurant down the street uh, that's a really good hole in the wall that makes amazing food, but you don't really want to know what happens behind it. What was something that you walked in, you saw they were cutting corners that you knew you would fix? Once you took over, uh, I would say a couple things. Uh, one of them, first and foremost, was that just not taking all the the adequate steps to properly sanitize after every single production run. Um, you know, just using the proper um, you know gloves, apron, mask. Um, you kind of have image of these guys that are sweating over a bar, but the facility is improperly air conditioned. Um, so just really, really kind of basic manufacturing and sanitation one hundred and one. Yeah. How long did it take from you exploring it to actually buying the business? 
I think I vetted it for pretty between 90 and 120 days and really made sure that I did a good appraisal of the nutrition bar industry, of just not make sure I understood the, man, the kind of the economics behind manufacturing and versus someone versus someone who uses someone else like a co-packer to manufacture. I felt we could save four or five points um, just by doing it in-house. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it took me 90 to 120 days. Yeah. And for someone who's interested, Pete, in buying their own business, what was the capital needed and, and how did the financing work uh, in the beginning? Because I think a that's a big concern point. for it's, a lot of people. And it's so different. I, I, I definitely didn't have a whole lot to work with. Um, I was looking at all opportunities um, in kind of the six-figure range, um, you know, looking at Quite frankly, most of them were going to be. I was either going to partner with uh, a younger entrepreneur, someone that I went to business school with, to create something, or I was going to acquire uh, kind of a, a little bit of a dog ear turnaround business. Um, so re- what what I did is I identified a company that not only like we could acquire the assets, but where I could also deploy a little bit of startup capital. Um, so everything was kind of in the six figure range, um, without getting too specific, but. By and large, you found early and often, like whatever you think you're going to need to spend, it is in the world of entrepreneurship, it's always, always more. And is financing needed from banks or can can you put a down payment on something like that? Yeah, t- typically um, uh, for kind of a distressed business, um, it, most they of the want time, all cash. Uh, for, the, for the most part, it's yeah. going to be a lot, cash, anywhere from 50 to 75 percent, um, some, some type of an earnout. The reason I'm a little bit vague on some of the details. No, that's is, cool. I don't. I know. No, it's only yeah, because you, it was just like a, a a little bit of a dog-eared operation. Yeah. So. No. No worries. I'm just curious of like your thought process and what people should be expecting. Like, should they go? Oh no, I went to my got an SBA loan for it, or you know, we need to put 50 percent down and then you know it was owner financed or whatever the case is. You know. It's. I, I can safely say that I still spent less than I would have had I gone from a pure startup raising outside capital from investors. Yeah. It, it would have cost a lot more to to kind of grow a business in our industry past five million in revenue, which is where we've been. It's you're going to need over a million bucks. You just you're not going to be cash flow positive in the first few years. It just doesn't happen. Right. Right. And so early on, tell me some of the. I, obviously, you walk through, you vet the the business, and you're like, okay, the, I can make a huge impact doing this plan. So what did you execute on when you took it over? What were the biggest impact that you you actually implemented? I think for what I wish I would have done, I'll, I'll answer the question first this yeah. way, uh, identify the right people for, for the job. I thought I could go in there and, you know, given a business school background and I'm young and, and energetic, that, oh, no, no problem. I, I can get in here and we're going to be $10 million business in a couple of years. No problem. How many staff uh, did they have at the time when you took it there over? Were, at the time, there were six people, mm-hmm. um, all of whom were no longer there within uh, 18 months. Um, kind of sometimes it's it's that kind of old uh, that Marshall Goldsmith what got you here won't get you there. Sure, yeah. Um, identified quickly early and on that we needed the right people that were ready to scale this business, um, and I think that was that 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 would have been that was a mistake that a huge mistake that I made is not realizing early on like it's all about the people yeah. and having the right team and it's taken me five years to finally have a rock star team on board. So you would have gone in really assessed who should be on board. And then clean shop the people who didn't have that attitude and mentality. What do you look for in bringing someone on? Uh, that, that's I think that's kind of the, the million dollar question. And yeah. having read hundreds of business type books, um, I, I wish I would have first and foremost done like a uh, will they be a good personality fit with my personality type? Yeah. Not just hiring people who could be like your buddies or your friends or cool, but realistically like looking at a couple of different personality tests. Do, are we going to be compatible? Looking at their track record, um, a lot of people pride themselves on finding diamonds in the rough. I now realize, like, I, I want people who've done this before, who've really scaled this, who who know how to get from point A to point B in their sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just getting getting to know someone through kind of the top grading through three or four rounds of interviews, not just hey, can we get along over like a cup of coffee? It really you don't know. So it takes a while to get to yeah. know someone really well and how how they're going to work with you in a workplace. Yeah. Who are the key people or positions you found that you need to put in place through over the, you know, the, the past five years that you said you developed yeah, this rock star team? You know, the first few years as any entrepreneur, you're doing everything. You're, you're burning the candle at both ends. You're yeah. getting really strapped. You think you can do everything and you can to get from point A to point B. But 
I, I realized like I was more of the, the kind of the classic entrepreneur trying yeah. to think about what's the next big idea, kind of the visionary role, and realizing that I quite honestly sucked at the operation side of things, kind right. of the day to day, and just knowing I needed was just this this grinder day to day business driver, just this classic operator right. who understood how to put it all together and, right. and execute and implement. I love ideas. I love thinking big picture. But yeah. when I get to the nitty gritty details, that's kind of where I, I, I you're kind a of, classic like visionary type of person that I don't want to worry about the details, but give me the big vision. And, and I quite I just I'm not that good at that. I, I wanted someone who not only is great at that, but loves those details and they know how to put a perfect plan to get plan together and then yeah. execute. Yeah. So I want you to compare something. Pete, talk about the early day. Like you said, you're doing everything right. So talk about a typical day in the beginning on all the things you're doing that I want to compare it to now. So what was it like in the beginning? Take me back to one of those crazy <laughs> long days. Just just trying to stay alive. I think like any entrepreneur, the first the first 12 months uh, scare the heck out of you. Um, yeah. And there's no sense of structure to the day. That was my biggest downside. I would just spend a little time on, okay, sales, a little bit of time in marketing. Okay, let's make sure the manufacturing looks okay. Spending time out in the factory. Do we have enough cash in the bank? And it's just this very um, kind of uh, just split personality where you're, just, you're, you're, you're doing too many things, kind of a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. um, so there was no sense of structure in my day. It was 100% reactionary, and which can tire you out extremely quickly. Yeah. And that was like the first three years were like that, yeah. just being pulled in 100 different directions. So what kind of hours during those first three years? Just to give people an idea, what were you keeping? Like what time you're getting and then stopping work and was this like seven days a week, six I days mean, a week? First one there, last one to leave. And as, as much as I now completely don't believe in that approach, I think for the first year or two, it, it does set a good example. You're, you are the pace horse. Um, so some days, like I'm, most of the time, you know, up at seven and I remember like looking back through old emails, like I was answering email at one, two in the morning. Um, which which is ridiculous because not you're, it's it's this this vicious cycle you get into and then you're you're more tired you're more reactive um, so the hours were crap and I was always doing email on weekends always responding on weekends and then on top of that we d we would do a lot of events you know we were passing out doing a lot of sampling so not only covering the booth um, during the weekends but just grinding during the weekdays and you're gonna it's a recipe for disaster recipe for burnout and as being like a, a sole founder it was a, an incredibly lonely road. So what did you end up, the initial team of six that you had, what happened? So you kind of cleaned house a little bit. What was the core group in the very beginning after you kind of, you know, kind of hired your own staff, I guess you could say? Um, finding a, a, a good salesperson. So although like I, I think every single entrepreneur needs to, needs to do sales for the first couple of years, it's such an important skill set. You need to see what it's like on the front lines, how to present to your potential customer, how to get a few punches in the face, how to respond. <laughs> right. um, but realizing that there's there's salespeople out there who are quite frankly better than I am, um, which is which is a huge realization that you can't be the best at every single role. You can't be the you can be the big picture person that wants to take it to the next level, but you need people in certain functions. So there, I had a, a marketing manager who was just she was so awesome at just evangelizing the product at the street level, um, being able to evangelize to consumers, and then having someone good, kind of a production manager, making sure the facility was in tip-top shape so when the FDA would visit, when organic certifiers would visit, gluten-free certifiers, kosher uh, rabbis would visit, um, that everything was just in tip-top shape. So those were kind of the, the three key roles that we had. Yeah, and so now, compared to the beginning, you said it wasn't structured, you're doing everything, which is expected. What does it look like now? Uh, in terms of the the, the company now, mm -hmm. um, it's it's bigger. Uh, I would say that the, the roles are essentially the same with different people yeah. at a higher skill level. And yeah. I just I looking back, I, it, making the wrong hires just for anyone listening, where it's going to cost you easily over six figures if you hire the wrong people. Um, and so now, what I've just found is I can safely say the team that we have in place is the team that can take us past 20 million but it took me a lot of different trial and error and some people yeah. who are great at getting you uh, to the first one or two million some people might be great at getting you to five and beyond um, if you can keep the same team as some entrepreneurs have then even better yeah. but really it's just it's, it's essentially the same um, roles uh, same man type of managers 
just people with a higher skill set. I mean, you made a conscious choice to bring on a high-level executive team, right? I, I have a, a VP of operations and a VP of sales and marketing, and yeah, they've they've done this once and once twice, sometimes three times before, so they know how to scale businesses. Yeah. So what brought you that decision? That's a big decision, right? I mean, it, you're paying big salaries too, you know, and tell me about that. Yeah, and this is kind of where I sometimes I differ with some of my entrepreneurial buddies. Yeah. They love finding the diamonds in the rough. Um, I, I think where I came to is I said, you know what, if I really want to grow this to the next level, and more importantly as an entrepreneur, you know, you start a business that you're passionate about, but realistically you start it because you, you imagine yourself being able to kind of work from home, take some vacation, spend time with family. And I said, if I want to get to that point where I'm focusing on the stuff that I really love to do that's of high value to the business, I need to find rock stars that are going to manage these other areas and do this twice as good as I can. Yeah. Um, and that's what I came to the realization last summer. I said, I've been at this for uh, four years and to really grow and double and triple our revenue and scale, I need to hire people who've done this in their sleep before. Um, and although you bite, you bite the bullet with a bigger salary, it's, it's, it's not as bad as you think if you're paying someone five or 6,000 a month and you want to go to 10 or 11,000 a month, it's, you're only looking at like five or six months of like, you have to bite the bullet and great people start to pay for themselves. So for it's sure. just you tighten the belt for a little yeah. bit. But by and yeah. large, like the, the ROI is going to be there for within sure. six months. Yeah, but so, initially pulling, pulling the trigger is, is not an easy decision, you know? Not at all. Yeah. No, not at all. I mean, you're watching every single penny going in and out of the business. So talk about distribution, Pete. How did you get into you, You're in some really big places, Whole Foods, Vitamin Shop. How did you get into those? Uh, I, I realized early on that um, a lot of these bigger retailers, you can have this incredible story um, and, and, a, and a really good background, but ultimately a lot of the relationships are going to lead you to retailers. And so we, we went out and hired a third-party nat uh, natural foods broker that just had much better relations. So you talk about people who are much better at what they do. They knew a lot of these retailers, and although you know you kind of have to pay a small commission to get in the door, otherwise I was just going to keep banging my head trying to get into these retailers who just they didn't know who we were. And you could have the best story in the world, but ultimately you still need that connection. And that's kind of what helped us get into the door. Although Vitamin Shop was really cool. They, that, that was more of a grassroots thing. Yeah, they had talk heard about, about us. They, they had seen, uh, they had heard about us at events through social media. Um, we, we were able to kind of um, get a foot in the door there. And um, just, just having, just through, heard us through kind of word of mouth and brand awareness, um, which was really cool. What's worked for grassroots efforts? Like, you the said events, first, have events been really big? Events are great. Yeah. You can only do this in so many regions, but you look at kind of our sales distribution and we're really strong in California because that's where we've been, that's where we're located. That's where we've been able to do a lot of our events. Yeah. Um, and then in, in store demonstrations. So primarily Whole Foods, Sprouts, really uh, being, people being able to get the bar in their mouth. And it's usually two or three times of repeat trial before it kind of gets hammered in their head. But yeah, you just, it's not, no secret. You, you got to give away some free product and right. really put the bar in uh, someone's mouth. So what's the advantage and disadvantage of getting into a Whole Foods or a Sprouts? For the bigger account, and this is what I encourage everyone, is you, you have to look at, let me take a look at the economics of, of the accounts you're getting into. Look at kind of the gross margins. Make sure that you're not giving away the farm just for top line revenue. And I think oftentimes we struggle with that because it can be. It seems very sexy to say, "Oh, I got into a, for sure. like, like a Trader Joe's type account, or I got into Kroger or Safeway with a thousand stores." You look at a lot of companies, and they, they they get a lot of distribution really quickly, and then just as quickly they hit cash, and that's it. They they tank afterwards. Right. Um, so just making sure you think long and hard. Really try to run the numbers and make sure that it makes financial sense for your business. Yeah. And so we've been doing that with every account and. You know that's why we've been able to be cash flow positive um, a lot more often recently, to because we're making sure that we're taking a very close look at the margins yeah. and the economics of the accounts we're getting into. So let's talk about the products, right? So what are the what's the best sellers? What are your personal favorites? Really, what what built the company was our uh, our number one seller. It's uh, our almond honey bar and just the the sheer simplicity. That's what our company's founded on. All the high protein bars that we have are five ingredients or less, mm -hmm. which is unheard of in, in high protein bars. Um, just simplicity is what founded us, and that's kind of what our top two sellers 
just three and four ingredients each. And we were finding that more and more consumers, as the trend is towards transparency in what you're eating, uh, clean label, meaning just very minimal type ingredients, whole food based ingredients, um, the, the consumers, the market, that's what they're asking for and that's what's really taken off for us. It's our almond honey bar and all of our high protein bars just having five ingredients or fewer. Simplicity. Yeah. So Pete, what's your process for coming out with new products? It's really fun. Um, we uh, we have about eight guys in production, and so we always give parameters. We want to make sure we have a really like really rich, delicious nut butter base, whether it's like an almond butter, cashew butter, macadamia yeah. butter. We combine it with a natural sweetener, um, with honey, coconut nectar, um, yacone syrup. These are all like very low glycemic natural sweeteners, and then uh, we, we kind of bind it all together with a high protein, um, whether it's uh, a whey isolate uh, or uh, a pea isolate, and we let the guys run wild in production. And okay, they'll, they'll blend different spices, cinnamon, cayenne, mm-hmm. different extracts like vanilla, all kind of whole food based ingredients. And they usually take some, I don't know, probably seven or eight tries. We and we all try it together in small batches, and we kind of vote on what we like the best. And mm-hmm. typically, the process from Starting to iterate and in design and, and ideate what the bars are going to be to actually launching it. I mean, it's a minimum of, of typically four to six months. Yeah. Because so we have to try. We have to see how the bars are going to taste two or three months from then. Try it again. Um, but it's a fun process. I mean, it, it's we we love doing that. And the guys in the kitchen have done an incredible job at helping us launch new flavors. Yeah. So, people, what was one that you were you know if got voted as we need to launch this, but you weren't so sure about that did well. With the, <laughs> with the odd customers, I, th- I think we've been lucky there. We we have a, a pretty unanimous. I mean, we we're all on the same page. The really? guy, guys in the kitchen love something, yeah, and we know we're, that we're very likely going to launch it. Mm-hmm. Uh, same thing with the office. I don't think we've had. So a you week. usually like everyone. It's a unanimous thing. It's not like everyone likes it. And you're like, I don't really like that crunchy, perfect pumpkin breakfast bar, and then it does really well. I I would never ever ever launch something. That I didn't think there was close to unanimous vote in the office. It's mm-hmm. just that you're shooting yourself in the foot. And I've tasted it as I'm sure you have some foods. Uh, you go to a natural food store and you try it and you're like, I don't know how the heck this business is going to survive. <laughs> who, who approved this certain flavor, this combination? I can say those. All, that's why we have a very small assortment. It's because we all love those flavors. What's the latest one that you've launched? Uh, we're actually we're working on one that's going to be with uh, more grass fed whey protein isolate, mm-hmm. um, and it's it, it's a bit of a mint chocolate combination. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, it, mint chocolate is very very common. No one's done it with five ingredients or fewer. No one's done it with kind of grass fed whey isolate before. Um, and so we're hoping to launch that one in the next couple of months. And then we're actually working on another one. It's more of kind of a, a spicy like coffee cayenne Mexican chocolate type flavor. What do you find works best when you go to – now it's ready to go to launch it. What works best to, to get it out and get the most sales and get the most reach? Uh, for, it, it's going to be for the next few launches, we're looking at uh, more of an influencer marketing-based approach, hmm. which is you know becoming more and more popular. But finding I, – I, I don't believe in pay-to-play. The, the influencers and, and brand evangelists that we use – they they just they want some free product, which is great. It, I think in the world yeah. of today, you have people with million person social media followings, and yeah. they'll they'll honestly they'll pitch anything for a thousand bucks, which is just not the way we want to build our brand. Right. Um, so so utilizing our the, the people who love us, um, just being able to give them a free carton of bars, and you would be surprised how many people are willing to kind of they're, they're going to put their name behind the they brand like because it. they sincerely love what they do. I don't ever want to feel like I have to pay to play. Um, I, I never. I, I don't want to have to pay for my best friends. I want to make sure people genuinely love the product, and if they don't, then no harm, no foul. So, who are your ideal brand ambassadors? In, in case someone listening knows sure. this person, who are you looking for? Um, someone first and foremost who lo- lives and breathes just whole food, natural ingredients. Who just a foodie who really cares about what's in their body. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it doesn't have to be someone who has six pack abs, who exercises every day, but someone who believes in it, believes in this very natural whole foods, holistic lifestyle. But someone who's also like very active. We have, um, you know, 70 year old grandmas who love to walk every single day, but they love our bar because for them, it's just this really delicious snack. So someone who's uh, active, who, who, who loves being outside, um, but who really loves whole food ingredients, whether you're an active skateboarder in your twenties, or like I said, 
a grandma in your 70s who just loves a rich almond butter snack. Um, we, we love everyone kind of in between. Yeah. I just looked up, Pete, and uh, this went by really quickly. One last question for you. Um, just talk about, since Inspired Insider, I always ask what's been the lowest moment and how you push through because you talked about resilience early on and then what's been the, the proudest moment so far? So <laughs> the, the, the lowest? lowest? I mean, the low, I feel like I've been punched in the face so many times and even uh, even my team would say like it's like every few months you kind of have like a really crappy week. Um, sometimes you feel like it's, it's the bipolar nature of entrepreneurship, yeah. the, the kind of the highs and the lows. Um, What's would an say, example of like, yeah, being punched in the face? I would say that a few, the few lowest moments probably would have been, um, I wouldn't even say losing big accounts because we really haven't, but um, it's, it's losing a, a key employer, realizing like, man, I've invested a year and a half, two years in this person and we need to part ways. Those are always like I, I, I'm a bit of a sensitive person and although I like to consider myself resilient, I'm still like I, human relationships mean a lot to me. Yeah. So losing like a key hire really, really sucks. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that's happened a few times and those are by far in a way like the lowest moments that I've had. Yeah. Um, in terms of the highest points, uh, I, I think the first couple years, sure, it, it's exciting to get into um, to new accounts or when retailers like you, you, you know, decide they're going to accept you. But for me, I, one thing I never get tired of is seeing a text message from a friend who sees my bar somewhere in a really cool location. Right. Just hearing people say, oh, yeah, I've heard of Rise Bar. Like, I love those things, the almond honey bar, three ingredients. I honestly never get tired of hearing that. And that kind of gives me goosebumps anytime I see someone like that know that they've been a consumer for our bars for a long time. I love it. Yeah. Pete, super valuable. Thank you so much. So people can go to risebar.com. Where else could they go to check out you or or the company? Yeah, risebar.com is great. Um, Amazon.com, if, if people prefer Amazon Prime. Um, and then uh, Whole Foods, Sprouts, Vitamin Shop, those are by far our three biggest retailers. Uh, we're in roughly 2,000 retail doors. Going to add another 1,000 in the next 12 months. Um, but f- far and away, b- risebar.com is the, the best place to buy us. Yeah. Pete, thank you so much. Appreciate awesome. it. Thanks so much for having me, Jeremy. Have a good one. Yeah. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hunt.